Friday Newsline is brought to you by the Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc. Antigua and Barbuda says Barbados is asking too much for its Liat shares. Our top story in Caribbean Newsline from Monday, July 15th. From the CMC News Center in Bridgetown, I'm Don Paris. Good evening. Antigua and Barbuda Prime Minister Gaston Brown says his government is not willing to pay an estimated 44 million U.S. dollars being asked by Barbados for its shares in regional airline Liat. The two countries have been holding discussions on the acquisition of the Barbados shares and last week Brown told CMC News the talks were still ongoing despite media reports in Bridgetown that they had broken down. Barbados, currently Liat's largest shareholder government, has indicated it wants to part with the majority of its 49.4% stake in the Antigua-based airline. Speaking on a local radio program on Sunday, Prime Minister Brown said if his country settled at the price being axed for those shares, it would be a steal for Barbados. And we are not in the process of giving away money. We're in the process of creating value and to get fair value for the people of Antigua and Barbuda. So as far as I am concerned, and I've said this, you know, to the Prime Minister of Barbuda, so she knows my thinking, to her the discussions cannot start at 44 million US. So she knows the position and she has since come down. Uh, now I can't go any further. Brown said he was disappointed the negotiating team would have contemplated agreeing to the U.S. $44 million deal. He said he's looking forward to, a, to an amicable settlement, but in the event that doesn't happen, Antigua and Barbuda will invest directly in the airline. And my colleagues will tell you that too, was always my first option. The issue though about buying um, Barbados' shares came about as a result of an impasse in which Barbados said it could not go any further, sell the planes. We said, hey, look, they cannot be a successful shrinking layout. We do not accept that. If that's the case, then let's negotiate and we will buy out not all, some of the shares. And they said they will sell up to 90% of the shares. If we are unable to come to a, a satisfactory compromise, then we will just put in our money and buy new shares. And we can still get a, man a majority position, which is not necessarily what we're fighting for. We're Antigua and Barbuda currently holds 34% of the shares in Liat. The executive director of Jamaica's leading anti-corruption watchdog, National Integrity Action, says parliamentarians who have failed to file statutory returns should not be allowed to run in the next general elections. Speaking on an RJR radio program, Professor Trevor Monroe said some MPs have been breaching the law by failing to submit statutory declarations detailing their assets and income. And he wants the law changed to stop them from contesting elections. We get more in this report from TVJ's Dashan Hendricks. The latest Integrity Commission report is out. Tabled in the Senate on a Friday, it shows despite public outcry over the last report, some politicians are still not compliant. The report says most filed on time, but there were still shortcomings as pointed out by the Executive Director of Integrity Action, Professor Trevor Monroe. majority of those who have, whose reports have been so examined, I think 28, still have further particulars to be supplied. Beyond that as well, Earl, over the years, MPs who have been in breach of the law, remember that these are the lawmakers, have been given a tap on the wrist. He points to various news articles over the years which supports his argument like this November 2011 Gleaner article showing MPs were fined but only paying $10,000. And this June 2009 article showing integrity charges dropped against three PNP MPs saying the unacceptable delinquency among PNP and JLP MPs and the inadequate fines don't serve as a deterrent. 
and so he wants to see changes to the law which will see MPs being barred from running in any election if their integrity filings are not in good standing. I think that would be appropriate. It would give teeth. It would make uh, MPs and potential MPs recognize that this is not just an administrative procedure. It's a fundamental tool to ensure that public officials are not enriching themselves privately at the public expense in an illicit and illegal way. He highlights that the current report points out that two MPs are now being investigated by the Financial Investigation Unit of the Integrity Commission. Their names were not made public as in a previous report. This has irked Professor Monroe. Transparency demands that we know who these two members are. Previous reports of the old Integrity Commission, you didn't have to guess. In the appendices of each report, you had the names of those who had filed on time, those who were late, those who needed further information to be provided, and those who were referred to the Director of Public Prosecutions. So it is both in the interest of the country and in the interest of the Prime Minister and other MPs that speculation not be run rife and that we be told what the situation is. Well, on Monday, on the heels of Professor Monroe's calls, leader of the Opposition People's National Party, Dr. Peter Phillips, called on the Integrity Commission to release a summary of his statutory declarations to the public. He said he wanted the commission to do so, so there would be no doubt that he had no objection whatever to the publication of his integrity reports. Prime Minister Andrew Holness has not yet commented on the matter. Former Barbados Central Bank Governor Dr. Dilal Worrell is urging regional countries to seriously consider using the United States dollar as their national currency. He says while Caribbean currencies served a crucial purpose when they were first introduced, they have now become a nuisance in today's digitized world. The economists argue that the current world of commerce and finance bears no resemblance to the world for which Caribbean currencies were devised. Writing in the July edition of his monthly economic newsletters, Worrell also responded to the question which he says surfaces when he calls for the retirement of all Caribbean currencies, the question of national sovereignty. He said that while most people believe that sovereignty is lost when local currencies are retired, replacing domestic currency and deposits with U.S. currency and deposits actually gives everyone in the country wider access to goods and services as he noted that the U.S. dollar is sovereign in international transactions. The Dominica Public Service Union on a Monday said it has found a strategy to force the Roosevelt Skerritt administration to start negotiations on salaries and other benefits for public servants. But it's keeping that course of action close to its chest. General Secretary Thomas Latang said the executive and the general membership have agreed on how to proceed, but for various reasons, the union will not be making the strategy public. Last month, he said the Public Service Union had written to the government regarding the negotiations for the 2018-2021 period. The union is seeking a 10% salary increase over that period. Coming up, a warning that the tourism sector in Trinidad and Tobago is under threat. The details after the break. Welcome to this year's 50th Caribbean Broadcast Union Assembly on the island of San Andres. San Andres is a small archipelago located in between Jamaica and Panama in the Western Caribbean Sea. A lush, exotic island rich in culture, history, gastronomy, and breathtaking scenic views. Known for its beaches and seven colored crystalline waters, the island of San Andres will be proudly hosting this year's event. CBU members will enjoy top-of-the-line accommodations for an unforgettable experience in San Andres, connecting Caribbean nations through this year's 50th edition of the CBU Assembly. Jump, 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 jump,
is concerned you explain how difficult it is to be in Miami yeah. preach and then you're beautiful at preach that. I'm gonna talk about the big elephant in the room preach how difficult is it to go and speak to executives I remember um, I have a lot of mentors male mentors in the radio industry and wild man Teddy T is one of them and I oh. remember coming up and telling him I really want to do music and stuff and he was like you being cute is really going it's gonna be a rough ride Welcome back. We continue with a warning that controversy, confusion, one-upmanship and super-egos are destroying Trinidad and Tobago's tourism sector. It's come from Chief Executive of the Trinidad Hotels, Restaurants and Tourism Association, Brian Frontin, and he wants Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley to step in. We get more in this report from CNC3's Jesse May Ventor. The structure in the tourism industry is hurting the country badly. He believes that unless that's rectified, we won't see any true progress or development in our tourism business. He says it's almost as though the country has an anti-tourism agenda. Over the last 15 years, there's evidence that we've had uh, over 10 uh, ministers of tourism, 10 chairpersons of tourist board, 15 CEOs. Um, this is a systemic issue that the public sector governance structures for tourism in this country are deeply flawed and they're seriously injurious to the sector. There is no other way to slice and dice it at this stage when you look at the history and the pattern of failure. Brian Frenton believes that perhaps it is time for the Prime Minister to assume leadership over the tourism sector the way he's done for the energy sector to halt the continued train wreck. According to the THRTA boss, PM Rowley has to make some tough decisions if government is serious about tourism being a major pillar of this country's economic diversification thrust. It needs to be put back into the almost the cocoon of the development or maybe redevelopment under the leadership of the head of cabinet, the prime minister, who will ensure that the right technocrats are in place. It could be a director of tourism model. There could be stakeholder councils. The current structure of a ministry, a state board, and management that are constantly in conflict, which has been our history for the last 10 to 15 years, cannot continue going forward. This is not going to make any sense. And he's also concerned that very soon, the sector will see a major brain drain as young people wanting to work in the tourism industry decide to do that in other destinations. There are countless examples of young people who have changed and are changing their lives by embracing a sector that whilst they do that, Rome burns and our public sector management is just considering egos, reports, investigations, and not and are not organized for success. So it, it must be severely disappointing uh, for young persons. And, and my concern is that at what point do they start not considering this destination as a career uh, pathway and start going elsewhere? Brian Frenton states categorically that if we are serious about tourism in this country, change must happen. Staying in Trinidad and Tobago, investigations are underway into the death of prominent local actor Raymond Chu Kong, whose body was found on Monday afternoon. Police confirmed that Chu Kong was stabbed to death at his home in Arima, near a police station. Media reports indicated that his son found him covered in blood in a chair. Arima Mayor Lisa Morris Julian, who knew the actor and playwright personally, said the community was in shock. He was an icon, not just Sarima, but uh, Trinidad and Tobago, the Caribbean writer, playwright, actor. He changed the creative industry in Arima because of his production company and, and Richard Ragobar Singh. It placed Sarima on the map for theatre and all the other arts included. Chu Kong was an award-winning producer, director, and actor involved in several musicals. He'd also worked with the late prize winner, Nobel Prize winner Derek Walcott. 
Two regional organizations have joined forces to make a mental health and psychosocial support priorities in disaster management. The Caribbean Development Bank and the Pan-American Pan -American Health Organization have launched the Stronger Together campaign. Mary Claire Williams has the details in this week's Newsline Health. Following the deadly hurricanes of 2017, the CDB and PAHO are working to ensure that Caribbean nationals get the necessary mental health support in the event of a major disaster. Mental health is one area of disaster management that is often overlooked, but the Stronger Together campaign aims to change that. Experience has taught us that successful rebuilding after disaster needs people who are feeling well are able to cope and can access services if needed. In this regard, mental health and psychosocial support are critical for the rebuilding. The campaign is also about building the resilience of people to better cope with the effects of disasters. In that regard, PAHO has partnered with the Barbados Defence Force to create the first Caribbean field hospital. We have now a register of psycho psychological first aiders which are ready to be deployed, but we also need to ensure that whatever we do with the medical teams in the field hospital is also linked with the psychological first aid register so that the teams can go out together both as a physical medical team, so to look after the bodies, but also importantly as well to look after the minds. The Barbados Defence Force has provided humanitarian assistance after disasters. Chief of Staff Colonel Glenn Branham says the mental health of the troops is also important on those missions. That it is not only important to respond with many helping hands to put to the plow, with men, material, stores, supplies, equipment, transporting ships and aircraft, but also with a comprehensive investment in the mental health the mental readiness and capacities to endure what, as we've seen in the video clips, are oftentimes regrettably very de devastating impacts on our communities, on our nations, on our people, Caribbean sisters and brothers. Barbados's Health Minister, Lieutenant Colonel Jeffrey Bostick, says this is one of the most significant disaster response initiatives to be launched in the region. He shared his own personal experience dealing with natural disasters as an army officer. I was exposed to a number of things which really, even as the commander of a task force for the regional security system in Grenada, I was certainly not prepared for. A number of things that I at the time said to my colleagues, these people shell shock to use a military term because at that time post-traumatic stress disorder was not really a term that we knew anything at all about. Bostick says it is important that countries like Barbados that have not experienced a major natural disaster for decades to adequately prepare. Mary Claire Williams, Newsline Health. Ahead in sport, West Indies lose to India A again. Stay with us. Sounds good. So we're going to put in almond flour, 
Um, this is flaxseed meal or ground flaxseeds. Uh, this is what keeps it together, what keeps the roti together. We have coconut flour. Raymond Reefer's defiant half-century went in vain on Sunday as West Indies A produced another inept batting display to slip to their second defeat in four days to India A. In pursuit of 256 at the Vivian Richards cricket ground, West Indies A slumped to 190 all-out in the 44th over to lose by 65 runs and fall behind 2-0 in the five-match one-day series. Tottering on 108 for 7 in the 30th over, Reefer, promoted to number 3, hit the top score of 71 to rescue some pride for the hosts. Tail ender Romario Shepard hit an accomplished, unbeaten 34, while Sunil Ambrose got 24. But the West Indies A top order failed once again in a spineless display. The innings was wrecked by fast bowler Navdeep Saini who claimed 5 for 46, while leg spinner Rahul Shahar supported with 2 for 47. Barbadian fast bowler Jofra Archer completed his fairy tale arrival in international cricket on Sunday, bowling a dramatic super over as England won their first ever World Cup by defeating New Zealand in a sensational finish at Lords. Axed to bowl the decisive nerve jangling over after scores were tied at 241, the 24 year old, who made his England debut just two months ago, remarkably held his nerve to deliver for his adopted country. Let's look back at the Super Finals, Super Overs in the World Cup Final. Outside edge, running up the hill. They can push for three because Butler's very quick. Stokes is out on his feet, but he'll make it. Just a single. Gap, is it? Yes, it is. Just the one. It's a perfect Yorker. They've got to push for two. He lost it in the sun. Nichols lost it in the sun. They'll get to. Last ball, Butler. He gets it in a gap. He gets a boundary. 15 off the super over. A wide. It is a wide. It's a freebie for New Zealand. Number one again. Perfect Yorker. They've got to get two. Guptill will get back. He's quick enough. Ah, he's got it. It's huge. It's gone. It's out of the park. Here's Archer again. Nisham gets him again. Will they go for two? Guptill says, yes, a misfield. More pressure. Nisham on strike. He's hit another gap. Guptill will come back. Don't worry about that. I've gone to the wrong end. Guptill is always going to make it. It's going to be on Martin Guptill. It's going to be on Martin Guptill. Two to win. Guptill's going to push for two. They've got to go. It's got to throw. He's got to go to the keeper's end. He's got it. England have won the World Cup by the barest of margins. Switching sports now, the Guyana Football Federation has decided to take the country's senior team out of the Olympic qualifiers. HGP's Jaden Samuels explains. After much deliberation, Guyana has withdrawn from the CONCACAF Men's Olympic Qualifiers scheduled for July 17 to 21 in Jamaica. According to GFF President Wayne Ford, this decision was resorted to as the organization has taken a decision to direct its resources to the preparation of players for the CONCACAF Nations League, which kicks off in September. 
He noted, however, that the players will continue their weekly training program. Many of the Caribbean Football Union countries have been forced to evaluate their international participation given the demanding CONCACAF annual tournament calendar. Other Caribbean Football Union countries, including Trinidad and Tobago and Suriname, have also opted out of the Olympic qualifier. The Guyana Football Federation has participated in every international tournament since my administration has taken office, Ford said. However, with six nation league qualification games ahead of us, we are forced to make difficult but necessary financial decisions. According to CONCACAF, the preliminary round of the tournament would have been 16 participating teams placed in four groups. The winner in each match will qualify for the CONCACAF Men's Olympic Qualifying Championship. The 15 remaining teams in the Caribbean are Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados, Cayman Islands, Cuba, Dominica, Dominican Republic, Grenada, Haiti, Jamaica, Puerto Rico, St. Lucia, St. Kitts and Nevis, Suriname, Trinidad and Tobago, and U.S. Virgin Islands. This tournament will enable representation at the 2020 summer. Over to action in the INF Netball World Cup, where the regional teams in the tournament suffered losses in Stage 2 of the prelimina preliminaries on Monday. In Game 3 at the MS Bank Arena, Barbados was crushed by the Australians by 69 goals. The Aussies dominated each quarter and the final score was 91-22. Meanwhile, England edged Jamaica by 8 goals, despite top goal shoot Janiel Reid having a 100% scoring rate. England dominated the first and third quarters with 14 14 12 and 16 10 leads before going on to win 56 goals to 48. And Trinidad and Tobago tasted defeat yet again, this time by three goals at the hands of the Ugandans. And that's the sport. We'll be right back. Caribbean Newsline is brought to you by the Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc. Welcome to this year's 50th Caribbean Broadcast Union Assembly on the island of San Andres. San Andres is a small archipelago located in between Jamaica and Panama in the Western Caribbean Sea. A lush, exotic island rich in culture, history, gastronomy, and breathtaking scenic views. Known for its beaches and seven colored crystalline waters, the island of San Andres will be proudly hosting this year's event. CBU members will enjoy top-of-the-line accommodations for an unforgettable experience in San Andres, connecting Caribbean nations through this year's 50th edition of the CBU Assembly. So former Vice President Joe Biden is a front-runner by a very wide margin in the way-too-early race for the 2020 Democrat Party nomination for president. Now, I have legitimate concerns about a potential President Biden because of where he wants to put his hands. And no, I'm not referring to that issue. I'm talking about his desire to put his hands or the hands of our government deeply into our pockets. Joe Biden is determined that the flood of illegal immigrants violating our border. Again, the major developments of this day. Antigua and Barbuda says Barbados is asking too much for its Liat shares. And in sport, West Indies A suffered their second defeat to India A in their five-match ODI series. And that's Caribbean Newsline. For news and sport around the clock, subscribe to carlinnews.com. And for more of our programming, log on to caribvision.tv and check out our YouTube channel. We'll be back here again tomorrow. But from all of us at CMC News, thank you for watching and have yourselves a good night.